Okay, good morning, Horizon. Good morning. And good morning, live stream, if you could see me. My name is Glory. I'm one of the hosts here. Um, if you're new, we're so happy to have you. There's a lot of ways you can connect, and we'll go over the announcements at the end. Really quick, um, if you have kids here, that's awesome. There's also, if you go down the hallway to the sanctuary, you can drop them off there or downstairs. And speaking of kids, I have this photo up here. Something I love that Kid Horizon does is they'll post photos of what the kids did during Sunday service um, while they're up here on like a private Facebook group. So this is some photos. And as you can see, um, my kid, I circled. And naturally, as a parent, the first photo or thing you look at when you look at these photos is your kid. So after several months and weeks of seeing these photos, my husband and I noticed something very particular. And these are all like different Sundays with um, our son. Jerry, if you could see here, if you can kind of look, there's like a pattern in every photo. And the pattern is that his beloved Belay's truck, oh. Monster Machine, yeah, is awesome. literally in every photo. These are all different Sundays. Oh, it's with God. him when he's learning a lesson. He's doing arts and crafts. As you can see here, he's just, that's just his buddy. And it just honestly is such a delight, honestly, for us to see something he loves. Like we know he loves Blaze and the Monster Machines, the show, but at church, this toy, he just has to hold on to it. So it's just such a delight for us to see that. And honestly, I know it's kind of simple, but I was reflecting on this and I was like, wow, like, it brings me so much joy to see that for my kid, the things that he loves and the things that he's getting into and the personality he's starting to form, that it makes me reflect on God and how he sees his children. And I know that God, when he sees us, he delights also in the things that we love and that we're passionate about. And oftentimes, those things that we're really passionate about as kids sometimes become our calling in our future lives. So just want you guys to know how loved you are and how God loves you and how you are uniquely you, just like Jerry is so uniquely him and how much he loves plays. So I just wanted to share that cute little thing. Um, and I'm going to pray for us, and then you guys can stand up after prayer. Dear God, I just want to thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning and bringing all these beautiful faces here at this church. I'm so grateful for this community and a place where I feel very safe for my children to be here and for me to get to know people and loved ones here. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be invited in this room as we praise and worship you and that we would have the ears to hear and the hearts open to hear your message today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. Uh, you can stand with us. Allergies have gifted me this super great gravelly deep voice today. Oh, yeah. um, so I'm very thankful to be married to someone who can sing really well. And Tyler's not bad either. So worship with us.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my saved find their way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less. In Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest prey, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. can have a seat. Oh, take a deep breath. I want you to think about today, this morning. Maybe if you're like me and you have littles and this morning has felt like a day already. Um, but just take a minute to think and reflect on this day, on this week, on the people that you have interacted with, whether it be your friends, your family members, your coworkers. Or maybe just people out and about.
How did you treat them? What was the interaction like? Did you come away from it filled up or empty? Did they leave the interaction filled up or struggling? Because God designed us to be in community with others. And yet that hurts sometimes. But if you haven't asked for forgiveness already, this is a beautiful place to do that. And so I'm going to pray a prayer from Ephesians. It was rewritten for a book called God in You by John Stumbo. And it comes from Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. And here's the prayer. Out of the Father's glorious riches, may he strengthen you with power in your innermost being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being firmly planted in love, may know how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ for you. And in you and through you, may you be filled to overflowing with everything that the Spirit is and provides. Lord, it is with that prayer that we go into this day knowing that we are forgiven for things that we know we did and for things that we don't know that we did, that we are loved just as we are, and that we can go and be loved to others around us. In your name we pray, amen. And thank you, Alyssa. All right. Hey, Horizon, good to see you all. Um, Pray with me as we continue in worship this morning. Lord God, thank you so much for the chance to be together as a community. Thank you for this just wonderful weather. What a turn, and we're so excited for the sun and the warmth and just the hope that spring brings. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would just, your presence would be thick in this place this morning, that we would all come face to face with this, who you are. And I pray that anything that's of me this morning would be quickly forgotten, and that anything that's of you would stick to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are continuing our series on biblical justice. And just the idea is, what is biblical justice? It's first of all, an acknowledgement that God cares about justice. God created the world to have order, to be a place where equity happens. And I kind of name these four things that uh, biblical justice includes. Fairness and equity, restoration and righteousness, judgment and consequences, and grace and forgiveness. And we kind of got into that a little bit last week. If you want to catch up, you can catch up by checking it out last week. These will be parts of each of the sermon. These kind of themes, these thematic parts will be in each one that we're talking about. But the, the lens that we're looking at this through is through individual, like being a person who does justice in the world. And that's what we talked about last week. And then this week we're going to be talking about community, practicing grace and forgiveness with each other. Um, in society, caring for the vulnerable will be coming up. And then globally, what does it mean for us to be restorers of human dignity? And so this morning, we're going to be talking about community. And this is a little bit more practical, a little bit less of like kind of the big like justice motif, and a little bit more specific to like the ways that we kind of wrong each other. Because got news for you, even though we're all Christians and we all love Jesus and we're all kind of doing community together, we are going to hurt each other's feelings. We are going to mishandle each other. We're going to do things that are wrong and need to be forgiven. And we just need to learn how to do that well together because it's a part of life. But we want to stand out from the world in the way that we repair, and the way that we forgive, and the way that we kind of like move forward and grow from our mistakes, and don't fall into patterns that are just wounding again and again and again. So the question this morning is, how do we embody God's hope for justice in community? And hopefully, we aren't faced with situations of terrible injustice here at Horizon, but I wanted to say this right here. It is within the realm of possibility. We see it all the time in the Big C Church. Horrible atrocities that happen within the church, 
that maybe try to get swept under the rug. We try to kind of not deal with it as a big C church. We've been spared from any, like, massive scandal at Horizon, but we are humans, and we need to be willing to acknowledge that. So I'm going to acknowledge that at some point during the sermon to talk about that as well, because we we don't want to be naive about what the possibilities are. And many of you have been through real serious church hurt, and I want to kind of just say something about that when we get there. But we also, we all deal with slights, wounds, and disagreements. This is more the everyday stuff that we live in. You're probably in conflict with somebody in this room right now on some level. <laughs> it might be your spouse just right next to you. <laughs> but we all deal with slights, wounds, and disagreements. That just absolutely happens. So how do we deal with this as Christians? Well, first of all, Peter asked this question to Jesus. He said, when Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, Peter asked this question thinking, I'm going to be, like, over-the-top gracious. I'm going to blow Jesus away. I'm going to be like, yo, should I forgive my brother, like, up to seven times? Like, that's insane. Jesus is going to be so impressed about how gracious I am. And Jesus responds with, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, which is actually more like a language translation of more like 70 times seven. I mean, he's going even more than 77. He's just saying, like, whatever you think you're doing, it's not even a drop in the bucket to what we're expecting from you. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king. And let me say this again about parables. When Jesus tells a parable, he's not saying this is exactly how things are. He's telling a story to make a point. So it's really try to understand the point that he's making in the midst of this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. All right, 10,000 bags of gold, we don't even have, like, what's the currency on that, right? Most of you only have, like, 20, 30 bags of gold at home, right? I mean, like... So um, the idea is that, like, an absurd amount of money, like, an absurd amount, like, basically the modern-day translation would probably be, like, $3.8 billion. This is, like, like you know, one bag of gold is, like, 20 years' worth of, like, living, maybe more than that. So we're, like, I mean, just an absurd amount. Jesus' whole point is, like, not to think too much about this. Like, who's loaning this man this kind of money? Like, what is his credit score that he's getting $3.8 billion? And what did he do with it once he got it? Like, how did he lose $3.8 billion, right? So, like, this is not us for us to kind of wrap our heads around. That's not the point. The point is an absurd amount, more than you could ever hope or imagine to pay back. This man is in debt beyond his wildest dreams to a master that he serves. Again, a servant wage, you're getting $3.8 billion. I want to work for that guy who's willing to, willing to lend $3.8 billion. As he began, so he called him in, and since he was not able to pay, the master had ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. And I will pay back everything, which is just a flat-out lie. <laughs> I mean, there's zero chance that this guy is paying this back. Like, I mean, zero. Like, it's not happening. The servant's master took pity on him and didn't just extend the debt, didn't just kind of give him more of a leeway, didn't lower his interest rate. He canceled the debt and let him go. It's off. Can you imagine the weight of that? And I'm certain, I mean, we should be able to imagine that because that is our dynamic with Jesus. He has canceled a debt that we could never hope to pay. And he's done that for us. When the servant found out, he found one of his fellow servants, yeah, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Now, you could kind of understand if he had to pay back the $3.8 billion, that maybe he'd be like shaking down every dollar that's out there, but he was just forgiven that. He has no reason to need this, and now he goes out and he's being, he's choking, physically choking a fellow servant. Like, and you can imagine 100 silver coins is a lot less than $3.8 billion. We're talking about like probably like um, a, din- a denari- basically a silver coin is like a denarius, like a day's wage. So 100 days wages. This guy's a little bit behind, but this is within the realm of possibility that he could pay this back over time, right? So it's like basically he's 100 days wages behind uh, and to a fellow servant. He knows where he's at. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged at the injustice of it all, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Again, this is not more about the nature of God's justice, but it's about the justice, right? This is God saying, I have forgiven you an infinite amount. How you interact with each other, how you love each other, how you forgive each other matters to me. It matters to me. So when we kind of enter this conversation, 
we're going to enter it from the standpoint of what does it look like to be forgiving and gracious in the midst of people who wrong us and do wrong us on a regular basis? Well, we are the forgiven ones. Let's all just remember that we take it from that lens first and foremost. We are the forgiven ones. So when we're dealing with the small debts with each other, we have to keep that in our minds. We have to let that be the overarching thing. That's not to say not to have justice and not to hold things to account, but to say under this whole paradigm, we are the forgiven ones, more a debt that we could never have paid, and it's from that lens that we approach this conversation. All right, are we all with me on that? All right, here we go. Ways we can experience injustice in community. This was off the, me just trying to think of things, so I may have left things off, you know. Um, but ways, here's, I think, ways that we can experience injustice in community that we probably all have really dealt with on some level. We can be offended, right? And it's easy to get offended. I don't want to be too much like the old man that's like, this, this generation's too easy to offend. I, that, I don't really think that. I think we are, more, we are sensitive to things that can be offensive. And I think that that is a, a reality that I think also our culture loves to do offensive things. And I think that that like, you kind of take pride in kind of putting things to people and making a post that's going to cause irritation and kind of being a troll. We have a whole culture of being trolls out there, people trying to get a reaction, trying to get people upset, and then reveling in like the discord that kind of follows that, right? So I think that it's easy for us to get offended. And it's, I think it's easy to get offended by something someone posts in our community. We see something, we think that's really ignorant, or they weren't thinking of the other side, or they're demeaning my viewpoint, like in a post that's like, or it's easy to get I may offend you from some things I say up here, and that is a reality that if it hasn't happened yet, it probably will happen. And so we need to kind of like address these things. Like I'm not trying to be offensive. That's not my goal. I, you know, that's definitely not what I'm trying to do here, but sometimes we do step on each other's toes as we go through things. Our viewpoints can feel degraded. Like if, as when someone makes fun of a specific viewpoint, like on Facebook, and you're reading it, and, like, and all the other people in your church are chiming in on that, and you're like, that's how I feel. They're, they're treating me like I'm less than. It's easy to kind of feel judged or offended by people that are out there, like here in a community, and it can erode our trust in people. That's one way that I think we easily kind of offend each other or that we experience a little bit of injustice with each other. Another way is that we can feel neglected or left out. If you're new to Horizon and you feel like there's like any church that you go to, it always feels like there's like a click that you're trying to get into a little bit, and then you find out that they all hung out the other night and you didn't get invited, and you're like, ah, oh, like am I on the outside of this? Like, like, why was I not called? Why was I not invited? Why was I not? In, and I can say this from whenever you're planning something at Horizon, planning anything at Horizon is a nightmare for me. I'm like, we're inviting like one family over. I'm like, but then the other family's going to hear about it and they're going to wonder why they didn't get invited. And all of a sudden we have like 20 guests and I'm like, now we don't have the food. So like, I, so we ended up just not doing things. Like, it's like so hard. So like, just know this all needs a lot of grace with each other, right? Like, we're, but it's easy to feel on the outside of things looking in. It's easy for clicks to, to form even in church. And that's not intentional usually, but that does happen. I remember I had this vivid memory of being when we were meeting in the movie theater. Before we met at this church, we met in a movie theater, and it had a really narrow hallway, like about the size of this row of chairs. And I remember if you were a new person walking in, literally every group of people was in circles face inwards, like six people talking, six people talking, six people talking. And if you're new, you had to like awkwardly be like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And they're like, like around every group of people that were already friends. And I remember just coming to me like, this needs to stop. Like, like, it is the most unwelcoming environment of all time where everybody's got their back to you and you're like trying to like passively try to get through without offending, without bumping into somebody. And we did change the culture on that. But I felt that's very symbolic of how a church feels sometimes. You walk in and everybody's got their own little circle and all the people that they already know and you're already, and you're trying to get, you go to a link group, you try to do something and you find out that you're not on the list or someone forgot to invite you or someone forgot to tell you about something that's going on. And this is just the reality that we live in. This does happen. It's easy for things to form, even at church. And it's hurtful to feel on the outside of things. It just is. It's human nature. We want to be included. We want to be known that we're seen, that we're recognized, that we're wanted. And even at church, we often send the opposite message, that you are forgettable or missed or not noticed. And that can erode our trust in community. Another way that it's kind of little slight injustices. We can feel mistreated or disrespected. Someone loses their temper with us, loses their patience with us, patience with us, chooses not to respond. You put a like, heartfelt email out there to someone, really wanted to talk about something, and they just never get back to you. I, may, I hope I have not done that to anybody in the room, but I very well may have. That's the kind of things happen. I've, I've, I am like so bad at like sending a text and then getting it. I'm like mid-text and I get a call and I forget to ever finish the send. And then like two months later, they text you something like, I never sent that text two months ago. And it was, like, about something fairly important. I swear I responded, and I didn't. I, like, looking at it, I did not respond, right? These are the kind of things that can happen, but how's that person feeling? Easy for them to feel like, hey, I reached out, like, with a heartfelt thing, and Ryan never even texted back. 
And we know that that happens. We have, we have grace for ourselves in those situations. But it's easy when you're already feeling like on the outside to feel mistreated or disrespected in that moment. We don't like the way that someone talked to us or ignored us. I have this really bad habit of like when my kids are melting down on the way out of church, I'm really friendly up until about that point when like my daughter's melting down and someone's trying to have a real conversation with me and I'm like, I got to get to my car. Like everything, <laughs> I'm shorter than, I'm shorter anyway, but, but I'm shorter than I want to be, like verbally as well as physically. Uh, but, but I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm just, you know, there's a lot going on there. And I feel like I've had to apologize. Hey, I'm so sorry I was not my best self on the way out of church. But, like, we do that to each other. We do that to each other all the time. Like, we all have these moments, right? And we're made to, like, sometimes we make people feel devalued or replaceable. Like, that they don't really matter that much. How about one more? We can feel used. Maybe you are one of the people who volunteers for everything, and you feel like you're the only one doing it. And everybody else kind of benefits from it, but nobody else is volunteering. Or... Maybe it's even like you're serving, you feel maybe you're over-serving and underappreciated. That's an easy way to feel. I felt like I was more in that category until I had kids, and now I feel like I'm like, I'm mooching. <laughs> I am mooching off of the generosity of the service of others because I'm like head, just trying to keep my head above water getting into church. So like, now I get why other people weren't serving as much when they were in that stage. And it's, but it's easy to feel like I'm not thanked very much for this. Why is nobody else volunteering? Why is nobody else doing this? It's easy to feel like you're kind of being used by the community. Or maybe valued for your resources. If you have a truck, you probably have felt this way. Why do I only get called when people are moving? And it's every time they're moving, they remember that I have a truck. I'm not getting invited out to the movies on a Thursday, but I'm getting asked to move every time, right? Or maybe like it's just that you are worried that the church feels like they just want your money. That is such a stereotype of like how people feel about church. And it's for a reason. The church has mishandled that in the past. So what do we do with all these offenses? I mean, this is a lot of stuff going on, right? And there's a lot of ways to feel when you come in Sunday morning hoping to get like an injection of just Christ-filled energy and you leave feeling slighted or maybe missed or like that person really just talked down to me and I'm feeling not a good way about that. And in our culture, it's very quick to be like, peace, I don't need this. I don't need this. Like why would I go if it's going to make me feel worse than I am? And I think we're really quick to kind of quit on things. So how do we handle these offenses? Well, Jesus says this, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave, the, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. We're going to talk about forgiveness, grace, reconciliation a little bit this morning individually. And I'm going to talk about it with levels. I think there are levels of this. And I think the first question is like putting it in the proper level. Because I think a lot of times we kind of take a, a, a one offense and maybe make it a three, or we take a three and we make it a five, and we're like so angry about something that maybe was like an innocent mistake. Here's the first one. I will have the grace to overlook the slight. Like, you know, and it, to do this, it requires a couple different things. I'm going to assume the best about people, especially their intentions. Because I think this actually solves a lot of things. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not uh, excusing that like, we're consistently doing offensive things. I'm not excusing that. We're going to get to that. Like, that's not like, people should have permission to say or do whatever they want. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think that often, if we actually did an evaluation and say, that's probably not that big a deal. I'm probably making a bigger deal of it. I'm probably more upset than I should be about that. I'm going to let it go. Like, she was, she had three kids climbing all over and that she didn't respond to me. Like, she probably didn't even hear me, right? There's easy ways to kind of take that. Assuming the best about people, especially their intentions. We don't expect people to say and do the right things correctly all the time. Maybe when that person said that thing that I didn't really appreciate, I'm going to give them a little bit of grace to not say the right things all the time. Heck, I think out loud. That gets me in all kinds of trouble. Like, I, because a lot of times what I start saying, within like a minute, I'm like, I don't think I think what I just said. <laughs> like, I get to the end of it, I'm like, I've said something completely different by the end of the sentence, right? I started here, I'm making a point, and midway through the sentence, I'm like, I don't think that's what I think. And then I'm kind of getting to the end, and then I'm saying what I actually think. And then the person's like, you said, like, the first reason, I'm like, oh, I did, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> that's not what I meant, right? So can we have a little bit of grace with people in that situation, right? Level two is address the hurt. Okay, I feel like we're not going to be right unless we talk about this. Like, and, I need, and I know that, and I need to bring it up with them. And that is seek forgiveness and reconciliation. That means asking someone to say, hey, this happened, and I, I know, you know, I want to assume the best about it, but I, I, I've been feeling a way about it. I've been feeling disconnected from you ever since this thing happened. Can we talk about it? And it's actually just kind of airing out. And maybe it is say, yeah, the person has an opportunity to ask for forgiveness in that. And this could be a beautiful kind of moment where you actually come to a better understanding of each other. You start to learn each other's needs. I didn't realize that bothered you so much that I do that. Okay, 
I'm going to try to be aware of that. Like, we're going to work at this together. We're going to try to build reconciliation. I will say this. If you have good friendships, like, the friendships that I've been through the fire with and that we've actually really hurt each other and then had healing, those are, like, my real friends. I remember, um, man, I was blessed in high school, college with just an, a large number of friends. I was really lucky to have just a lot of really great friends. And I remember it was so easy for me to avoid conflict because, like, if I was, felt in conflict with someone, I'd just go hang out with these people instead. And then eventually it would go away. Or it wouldn't go away, and our friendship would go away. And it didn't, like, I didn't let it hit the way it needed to hit, probably. And then I remember being in college, and one of my best friends, we just kind of got in this ongoing tension that was going on between us, unnamed tension. And it felt really weird, and we were living together. And he was, like, one of my best friends in this whole world. And I remember finally we just like, dude, we need to talk about this. Like he brought it up and we actually dealt with it. And I remember like being like, oh man, he is worth going through this conflict with. And that was like a brand new idea for me because people, I didn't value like the, uh, the discomfort of conflict wasn't important enough to me to go through for most people. And all of a sudden I like, we worked it out and we actually, like I watched him like really it was about, like we were both like. <laughs> it's so stupid. I'll tell you the whole story because it makes more sense. We were so such stupid attention seekers. That's what it really comes down to. I'm a selfish attention seeker. But there was like, like we were in, in groups, like basically like there was one girl that I really, really liked and he always had her attention and he knew that and it was just like graded at me. It just graded at me that like he wasn't kind of like setting me up with the volleyball at all. He was just kind of like stealing the show every time we were around. And I was just so sick of it. I was like, dude, like you have everybody's attention. You don't need this person, right? <laughs> and so like we finally had that conversation and it came down that there was insecurity in both of us and we were able to name our insecurities and we were able to talk about those things. And I watched him like love me in group settings from that point forward. Like he actually, I watched him choose to try to like set me up or be a good friend or care for me better. And it was just like an amazing, I'm like, oh my gosh, he really cares about me. He's a true friend. And when we worked through that, we actually, we got to demonstrate our love for each other and working through reconciliation. And guys, that's a big part of it. Like, do you love people enough to go through the, the awkwardness of actually having it out a little bit to kind of get there? Then put things behind you and choose not to hold a grudge, right? Once you've worked it out, choose not to hold that over them for the rest of their lives. All right, level three. I'm going to move a little faster through this. Address a pattern. Sometimes these hurts aren't just one-offs. This is happening again and again and again, and, like, and I'm starting to feel a pattern in this, and we need to talk about that, and we need to actually work on breaking the pattern of the, of the hurt that's going. This person's always posting about this thing on Facebook, and it's driving me nuts, and I find myself not wanting to talk to them anymore because I'm so angry about our online presence. That happens. Or this person's like, they're always doing things at their house, and they're never inviting me. Like, what's, wrong? what's off with that? There's so many ways that we kind of create a negative pattern, and we are feeling a way about it, and it's just going to get worse and worse. And part of addressing it is to say, hey, like, we need to actually deal with this between the two of us. And seek restoration. Part of seeking restoration is trying to break the unhealthy pattern that's going on between us and establishing a new one. And saying, because I care about you, we're going to change the way this pattern of interaction happens. All right, level four, intervention or mediation. Guys, sometimes we can't work it out. Like, we are in a really tough space. We disagree about whether it's even a problem or not, and we need someone to sit down with us to actually have this. Because I'm a pastor, I get asked to kind of sit down in these conversations a lot of times, you know, just to be a, a presence in the room. I am not a counselor. That, call Beth McDonald if you want that. You want somebody who's actually certified. <laughs> there are people who are certified. It's not me. But I do get the opportunity to kind of sit with people and actually help them kind of work through things, and it's an honor and a privilege and a hard thing, but it's also beautiful to kind of watch the, the transition that happens, the transformation but sometimes outside input is necessary to get an actual perspective on these things. Accountability may need to be put in place. And guys, sometimes this can get really hard. We've actually had a situation years and years ago where there was a person who was bipolar in our community, and he was so fun and enjoyable most of the time. And then he would not take his medication for periods of time, then he would get low. And he would call the women in our small group and just say horrible things to them, like horrible things. And, like, um, especially if they didn't answer, he would leave it on their voicemails, like, real angry. Like, they were dodging his call. He would just be in this real dark place. And it's like, look, I love him, and I want him to be a part of Horizon community. I want to see transformation in his life. I want to see healing. But this needs to be a safe space for these women as well. And there was this, there was an impasse happening. And I had to sit down with him and be like, look, here are the conditions of which you can be a part of. Like, we can't have so-and-so afraid to come to church because they might run into you. 
Like, this is, we need to work through this. There needs to be accountability to this. I'm going to call you every week. We're going to ask how you're doing with your medication. Like, don't lie to me. We're going to talk about these things. And you need to lose her number. We need to delete that. And we need to kind of like, like we, we want you to be a good friend to people in the women in our community, but that one needs to have a break and get some space. And guys, sometimes this just has to happen. Because we're all broken people, and we're coming from broken things, and we don't want to chase people away on either side, but we need to have, like, rules to how our society is going to really work, right? And I've had to have worse conversations with that about people, about people who have done real damage. This happens in our community, and even here. And so it's important that we actually have interventions sometimes and accountability, and sometimes even say, like, hey, we want you to know Jesus, and we want you to follow him, but, like, we need to help you find a, di- a different place to do that because some of the damage has already been caused to this. I know it sounds really hard. This is the reality of trying to do life together. All right. Because of the transforming power of Jesus, community that is centered on him should feel different from the rest of the world. It should. When you come to a church, it should be easier to swim upstream towards Jesus. You should be able to walk in goodness on an easier way because of the people you're surrounded by. This is what it says in Ephesians. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. I love that that's like... Part of the motivation of why you need to work and contribute is not for yourself that you have something to give those in need. That's part of like being a part of community is saying, I want to give to those who have less than me, even when I don't have much in the first place. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Guys, there are so much of the Bible that just teaches us how we are supposed to live, how we are supposed to be with one another. And now we're all going to fall short on this. And so part of it is asking for forgiveness and being restored, and then asking for forgiveness and being restored. And when I find a pattern in my life, I start to break that pattern, and I ask for accountability to say, help me to not be that way anymore, because we're all moving towards Jesus together. This is the noble goal of it, but it's messy when you're in the day-to-day mess of it, isn't it? It's kind of, there's times that it's just going to feel like this. And we work through those things together. But where else are you going to go that's going to help you to be more like Jesus and then the, the family of God, where we're all doing this together, where we're all swimming in the same direction, trying to be more like Jesus together? This is the opportunity that we have. But part of how we do that is to have the real conversations with each other, to be willing to say, I'm sorry, to be willing to be restored, to be willing to say, hey, I know this is awkward, but that really hurt my feelings when you did that the other day. This is part of how we restore each other and build into each other. This is part of how we grow to be like Jesus. All right, I want to say this real quickly about serious offenses. I know many of you have had serious wrong done to you in your life, sometimes by family members, sometimes from the church that you came from. And I know that that has legitimately happened to so many people. You're not alone if you're in that place. I want to say that one more time. You are not alone if you are in that place. You are in good company, maybe shoulder to shoulder with someone else who's been through something like that too. So glad you're here. I'm so glad that you took a chance to keep coming to church when something like that has happened to you in your past. Thank God that you're here. Some of us have family members who have been on the offending end, and it's not just one or two of us. Like, I know there's many stories where we've actually watched perpetrators and people who have done damage, or we've been a leadership of a church that has really swept some things under the rug, and there's some guilt and shame and regret about how those things have been handled. I'm so glad that you're here, because where else is God going to restore us to in the family of God? Where else can you ask for redemption and forgiveness and say, I'm going to do better the next time. I'm going to be a part of creating a different kind of culture. Guys, we're side by side with people who have been wounded, but people who have done wounding, and we're growing together as a church and dealing with these things. But there's a reality that, like, Horizon needs to be aware of the the fact that some things could happen here. And there are times we will not be a church that says we're going to do an internal survey or an internal review of that. There's times that authorities and outside parties need to be involved. If something ever happened in our kids' program, something ever happened, we have a personnel committee where people can report things. You'll hear it here. We are going to actually address it. Because justice 
is a big part of forgiveness. And we're going to get to this in a second. Forgiveness does not mean the absence of justice. I love this quote. I was actually reading an article by an ethics, a Christian professor, a professor of Christian ethics. And he used this quote. So I don't know who this person is, but I love this quote. It was in this article um, that we're going to quote the article in a second. But forgiveness is not a substitute for justice. Forgiveness without justice is cheap reconciliation. Genuine and lasting reconciliation is possible only on the basis of both forgiveness and reparation of wrongs. Reconciliation has two locks to open. One might say if forgiveness is one key, then justice is the other. Forgiveness is the one half of reconciling work that a victim exercises, while justice is the other half of reconciling work that is reserved to the perpetrator. Only after having achieved both goals can true reconciliation occur. This is, we want true reconciliation, not slapping lipstick on a pig and saying, look, we're all okay, we're all brothers and sisters, like, we'll just pretend like that didn't happen, right? That's not what we're about. We're about, like, healing and true reconciliation, and sometimes that involves, like, actual justice being done, and when then we work to reconciliation together. We're, we're getting past that, like, in the sense that it's, like, dealt with, healed, worked through, and that person's getting healthy, and maybe in the system because they've, what they've done requires that. And we still believe in their redemption. We still believe that God will restore all things. I told you last week that I worked, in human, I worked in an organization that fought against human trafficking. And part of what we decided to be like objectively different about in Araminta was that we would have love and a heart for the perpetuator of sin as well as the victims. And nobody else in that arena wanted to touch that with a stick. That we believe that even the people who did the victimize, like they can be redeemed. That re part of that was that they were brought to justice they are told about the goodness of God. We have the opportunity to journey towards grace. And that's, I mean, that grace is given immediately, but they go through the process of being restored in that way, through, through the process of justice. All right, how do I respond when I'm the offending party on anything? First of all, let go of your defensiveness and truly listen. Someone comes to you and they say, hey, I felt like you really brushed me off. I didn't brush you off. That's, that's my like, gut reaction. Every, whatever I'm accused of, my immediate reaction is, no, I didn't. It's like, it's like wells up in my soul. It's the overflow of like everything in me. It's the like, I'm going to defend myself. I had a reason for that. I had a reason for that. Nobody wants to hear your reason, dude. <laughs> Just hear what I'm saying. Hear my feeling. Hear what happened and listen to it, right? Like this is, so I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone else. Let go of defensiveness and truly listen when someone approaches you about something. A good question to get to the bottom of is what, what is the need we are addressing? Like what, what wound did I create? In this, like, what is the need that they're bringing to me? Because they're, they're coming to me with this for some kind of reason. What, what's the need that they have? It's to know that, like, I, I care about them. I love them. They're welcome here. They're included. They're valued. Whatever the need is, let's get to the bottom of that and actually kind of talk about that. They need to know that I'm willing to kind of say, I'm sorry for what I did wrong. I used this quote last week, but I think it's worth saying again. The righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. The wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. Are we willing to disadvantage ourselves for the goodness of community? Even if we feel like, I didn't really, like, that was not my intention. That was not my, uh, that's not, I didn't even really do that. Are we willing to say, look, I will take a look at myself, and I'm sorry for what I did wrong, and I'm going to continue to kind of pay attention to that. Will you call me out again on that if it happens again? That's me saying, like, I'm going to take, like, I'm going to disadvantage myself, my right, I'm going to lay down my rights for the sake of the community because I want the community to thrive. All right, here's the quote from the article I was reading. This is a, a professor of Christian ethics. As Jesus took a risk and paid a significant price in reconciling with us, the same divine grace compels us to take a risk in reconciling with others. He had been talking about Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus went to do, like, to repair with all the people he had wronged. The story of Zacchaeus reveals that reconciling with others is rooted in the will of God. Thus, we should be motivated by God's grace and by our gratitude rather than by guilt or shame. Guilt and shame do not move a person toward God. Rather, guilt and shame produce procrastination, fear, and paralysis. The power of divine grace is far stronger than the power of guilt. God's grace, though invisible, is transformative. It sets a new motion in our hearts. Once entered into our heart, it convicts, compels, and convinces us away from the fear, anxiety, and shame toward the hope of reconciliation and a fresh start. Part of what we do with this is remembering, even if you approach with something, instead of getting defensive, maybe you say to yourself, God, thank you for forgiving me. I know I'm forgiven. And so because I know I'm forgiven, I can operate with grace towards you. I can hear what you have to say. I can be honoring. I can put, my, put you above me in this way because I know that I'm truly forgiven. If we fall into guilt 
and shame, of course you're going to want to defend yourself. You're angry at yourself. You're holding it all together. You're trying to kind of like cast blame all around you. But if you can stand and say, I know I'm forgiven, so I can handle the fact that I've done things wrong. Because I've stood before God and said I've done things wrong. When, when you're forgiven, you don't operate out of, I like how it says procrastination. It can lead to procrastination. Isn't that the truth? I know I need to do that. Like tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe the week after that. When I get time, I'm really going to set that right. That's anxiety and fear kind of winning the day. But when we know we're forgiven, we can kind of address things head on. All right, individual people, why, why does all this matter? Individual people are worth working through things with. That's part of what we believe in this community. Each of you is so valuable that you are worth going through the fire with. It's worth going through that with each other. Jesus demonstrated this with all that he did. Think about every interaction where Jesus kind of pulls out one person from the crowd and addresses them and the need that they have. In the midst of all the needs, he sees the individual. And he does that with each of us. We're meant to be peacemakers and agents of reconciliation in the world. Do you know that part of being a Christian is that we're called to be peacemakers and agents of reconciliation in the world? It's what we're sent out into the world to do. But how can we fulfill our mission if we can't do that with the person sitting right next to you? How do we do that if we can't work it out with the people that we can see? One last scripture for you, and I use it a lot, but I love it. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself at great cost to himself, at great indignity to himself. He set us right with him and restored that relationship. And now... Through Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that we would be a part of the work of reconciliation in this world, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Again, we are going to the world to say that God wants to be reconciled to you. And then if they look back at us and say, then why are you guys all so angry at each other? You can't work through things together in your community. To come to this church and we can't even work through our own stuff? What does the message of reconciliation have to say? If we can't even work it out among each other, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All right, just a couple questions to leave you with this morning. Are there unresolved conflict hanging, is there unresolved conflict hanging in any, any of your relationships? I would be shocked if anyone in this room is like, None. I keep a really short list. If you are that person who says none, I bet you there's like five people who have conflict with you. You just don't know it. <laughs> you should probably like do a little inventory of like, how mad are people at me right now? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I'm just doing my life, defending people left and right. Yeah, so that's the question. Is there unresolved conflict hanging over any of your relationships? And then the question I would follow that, what is the need that needs to be addressed in? What is the need underneath those that needs to be addressed in? Are you addressing, are you willing to go into that, dive into that, and address the need that is underneath the hurt? Um, if Bill would come back up, or, or the whole worship team, actually, come on back up. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then they're going to lead us out. Lord God, thank you so much uh, for the ways that you love us. I thank you that you were willing to just go through the indignity of dealing with us in the midst of our sin, that you paid such a great cost to be reconciled to us. Lord, we are the servant who has been forgiven an infinite sum. And in the midst of that, what we're called to kind of lay down for each other is very small. Lord, teach us how to be people of reconciliation. Teach us how to be quick to forgive. Teach us how to be courageous in addressing patterns and establishing new healthy patterns in our relationships. Lord, teach us how to be a people of reconciliation so that we can go out into the world and be a voice of peacemakers and voices of agents of reconciliation in this world. Lord, thank you for restoring us and making restoration possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get saved. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Every chain to break every chain to break every chain. thank you that this is a community where we can be safe, that we can bring up hard things to each other. Um, but because we know there's grace when we do, and forgiveness, so we just thank you for that, God. Amen. Amen. Thanks, worship team. Wow, that message was so good, and I don't know if it's because it was actually good or if I dropped the kids off for the first time and I was finally able to listen to a message. <laughs> Um, but that was truly good. I knew I felt very convicted as I was listening to that. Um, so I hope you guys did too. Um, so now we're going to go into announcements. All right. Welcome lunch. So this is so exciting. We're here to celebrate Tyler and the Bellow family right here. It's actually going to be in this room. So you guys can go to the bathroom or get some snacks and mingle and then come back here. Um, yeah, we're just going to set up some tables right here uh, to celebrate the Bellows. So that is today. And another announcement, so April Men's Night, so this is going to be the NFL Draft Poker Night, so Ryan said you don't need to know how to play poker at all, um, you can literally just bring $5, and um, it's a, th I think the draft is like a three-hour event, so it's kind of just very low-key, um, just something fun to do while they're doing the draft, so it's right here at the church. And Horizon Board Game Night, April 19th, I believe that is this uh, is it this Friday or this weekend? Yeah, so come to that and text Brett if you want to come at that number. 
And as always, if you guys need prayer, it's just right down the hallway in the sanctuary to the right. So um, I believe Andy is praying. Yeah, raise your hands if you're praying today. Andy and no one else. (laughs) Um, Okay, so yeah, if you need prayer, you can also, if you're on live stream, you can text that number as well. All right, Tarzan, hope you guys will stay for the lunch, but um, hope you feel loved here and be loved in the world. (laughs) 